Hello, friends. I'm joining you from a stupendous and warm and not rainy New England summer day where I've just gotten off the phone uh, with my friend Zach Carabell, who's also an LP in Vestigo Ventures. He has written a book called Inside Money, Brown Brothers Harriman and the American Way of Power, which is a fascinating read about essentially a more genteel era of capitalism and uh, perhaps a slightly less nihilistic and self-centered approach to um, sort of doing well by doing good. Um, I think you'll all enjoy the book. I certainly hope you you go pick it up where books are purchased um, or you check out the audiobook. Um, my conversation with Zach is maybe a bit of a teaser for that because Zach does the audiobook himself. Um, he's a fascinating individual and an erudite and an investor and uh, an author. Um, and I think you'll really enjoy the conversation. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Zach and myself. Thanks. Zach, it's great to see you and um, thanks for making time today. Thanks for having the conversation with me, Frazier. Um, so I know a lot of viewers are familiar with you and your work, um, especially our LPs who should have a copy of your latest, um, but it would be great if you could maybe give a little bit of context on, on your background. Ooh, one of these open-ended questions. Uh, I have a joint career as a writer and someone in finance. I was an academic. I got a PhD. I de decided that academia and me were not going to be lifelong partners. And I moved to New York to become a writer, which I liked and was and have been, but also then kind of inadvertently added a financial career to the mix, uh, partly because of 9-11 and someone I was going out with who then became my wife, uh, whose <laughs> father had a firm in the World Trade Center and uh, that they were devastated by the attack. So I joined this firm, became an investor, ran a financial company, ran a hedge fund, was the head of strategy for a, a pretty well-known financial technology company called Investnet. And then I just kept writing books. Um, and in many ways, the book that I just did, Inside Money, is probably the most coherent fusion of those two careers of all the books that I've done. Although I've done a lot of columns that fuse historical perspective and who are we and what are we with, with the experience, real world experience I've had in the financial industry. This book about a 200 year investment bank and its, its journey through the American past and into the present is probably the most pure iteration of both my background writing history and writing about politics and writing about economics and my background being in the financial services world. Fantastic. And, um, you know, I think we've, we've established your, your sort of bona fides to write this book. Um, and other than as an expression of self-actualization, um, why did you decide to write it? <laughs> Everything should simultaneously be an exercise in self-actualization and have greater, agree. greater implications agree. beyond the narcissistic na navel gazing that we all do on a regular basis. Um, I mean, I wanted to write a book about the role of money shaping American society over the course of all of American history. And particularly about like, who were the, how did America make money in the 19th century? Who made it? How did the men, and they were all men, just as a clear indication of what this book is, uh, how did the men who made the money of the 19th century shape the global economic system of the 20th century as America rose to, to the centrality of, of global dominance right around the, the end of World War II? And then where does that leave us now? And that was the arc of what I wanted to examine, but you can't just I mean, you can write a book about a, th a thesis, an idea, people do it all the time, but it's more compelling to find a story to attach that to. And Brown Brothers Harriman, as it turns out, is, is the oldest continuously existing private bank, investment bank, they're more of a private bank in the United States. And, and that alone doesn't make them worth writing about, um, meaning a long life is not necessarily an interesting life. But they're sort of at every important juncture of American history and American economic history, and then the shaping of the global system, you know, the World Trade Organization, the, the, the UN, the national security state, the, the partners of Brown Brothers were sort of central to that as well. Um, so they became a perfect exoskeleton for that story. But what I didn't know is, was how much I found their story 
increasingly fascinating as I got into it. Um, I initially was like, look, these are a group of very staid white Protestant bankers and, and remarkably have remained that way over the 220 years. Not a lot of black sheep. And, uh, you know, no wayward son who had to be bailed out from a, a brothel in Paris or something. Like, it's just, they're... Yeah. But th that that quality of kind of rectitude and morality and, and service, I, I became much more enamored with as I wrote the book. So I think, um, you know, when you're handling a topic like this, and not to give too much away to those who haven't read the book, um, though I think you've sort of alluded to, to your perspective with this affection that you developed for the characters, I would assume one could be accused of being sort of nostalgic um, and mourning a, a kind of gentlemanly capitalism, which never existed. Right. Um, you know, one, is that true? Have you faced that accusation yet? And how do you keep your perspective as a historian? So I definitely have had that question, and I think it's a totally legitimate question, and I asked myself that question as I wrote the book. So there is a difference, I think, between the nostalgia of, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could go back to that? Uh, I have none of that nostalgia, partly because it was an extremely, by the late 19th century at least, it was a very exclusive coterie. And if you weren't born into it, if you weren't of the right race, the right gender, the right class, you were not welcome at the table in any manner shape or form uh so i certainly wouldn't have been welcome at the table you know this would not have been a cohort that would have embraced me and back to the narcissistic part it's not just about me it's about it, it that was a world of exclusivity that a lot of the 60s and 70s generation rejected and said hey you know democracy should not have an exclusive aristocratic financial elite at the apex of a system um it should be a more open and embraceive system but you can look at the past and find elements that have been lost and say, hey, we could meaningfully apply the ideas of the common good can only thrive if private interests recognize the connection between their own profit and the profit of the whole. You can't endlessly beggar the commons, that you need to be of service, not just to yourself and your firm and your clients, but to the larger society. Those are cultural and moral elements that Brown Brothers Harriman embodied um, that I think we can meaningfully apply. And let, let's leave aside the exclusivity and the, the prejudice at the lower classes or the people not like them, and, and certainly not embrace the degree to which they were complicit in, in profiting from slavery and profiting from the cotton trade, and certainly not be nostalgic about the way in which they maneuver the US government to protect their interests by invading and occupying an entire country of Nicaragua in 1912. You know, there's a lot about them that you wouldn't want to go back to that I don't admire and that I, in the book, do not laud. But I think we can use the past constructively as instructive and constructive in how we, in the present, shape our future. Um, no, I think. I think the point that you make is well taken on the difference between admiring elements of the past and wanting to go back to all, all of the past, sort of in a literal sense. Um, you know, you also articulate um, something that I don't think is particularly controversial, but that we're, we are sort of living in times of malevolence and sort of cultural nihilism. Um, and, you know, alluding to this earlier, could you talk maybe a little bit more concretely about what does the value of a book like this have for today? Um, how do you how do you think about the kind of Pandora's box argument that we just you know we can't put decency back; it's gone. I think we can endlessly choose and remake our culture and our society, and maybe that's utopian, um, but I believe it, and I believe that we are constantly in the process of figuring out who we are individually and who we are collectively and in, in the moment that's a very messy process right uh it doesn't the, the idea that like earlier generations of americans whether in business or in government you know sat down and honorably hashed out their differences to come out with some sort of consensus and compromise i think is a is a completely rose tinted and ultimately false view of how change happens uh, but that doesn't mean the culture doesn't change and that it's not possible to do so with intent. And the story of Brown Brothers Harriman is, is a very intentful corporate culture that gets reinvigorated and, and retaught with each successive generation, even when the family is no longer 
running it. And that doesn't mean you have to embrace all of their mores, but, but a lot of them are, you know, a common sense that we've forgotten. Like any risk you take on the upside is a massive amount of risk you're taking on the downside of, of a fund, you know, Vestigo, like you have to think about all that time as, as a good investor, um, that we do, we are embedded in a larger framework and my own and our own collective gain can't be endlessly pursued if the world around you is falling apart. I mean, in the short term, it can, of course, and, and the financial world in particular is littered with that, you know, littered with short termism. And I don't care what effects that has and I don't care who, who loses if I gain. Um, but I think culture does matter and, we, and you can choose it. You can certainly choose it in a company. You can choose it as an individual. You can somewhat choose it as a family. Uh, and I know that's not satisfying to people who want like what piece of legislation or what regulation or what what thing can we do now to coercively force otherwise recalcitrant companies to behave better. Um, yeah, you can pass regulations, but but behaving better is, is much more about the culture that you embody uh, than it is about the coercion that you bring to bear. I, I thoroughly agree, and I think that's probably a good place to end the discussion of the book because uh, I don't want to give any more way. Um, and I mean, everyone watching this um, can at least access YouTube and email, so I presume they can find your book. But uh, yes. maybe we can make it a little bit easier if you wouldn't mind. You know, anywhere on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, there's an audio book which you know people have actually been buying and listening to all 17 hours of me. This is like a, I guess a, a taste of things to come with <laughs> the audiobook. Uh, so it's it's out there and it's in a lot of bookstores still and it, it it's easily obtainable. Fantastic. Well, um, this has been a real pleasure and um, we really do need to catch up in person before too long. I'm hoping Delta does not scotch all plans to do social work things. Um, and uh, and thank you so much for being with us today. And I celebrate that sentiment. Thanks, Fraser. Thanks. Bye.